internet. Oh yeah, sure. There you go. Cool, thank you.
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah. So if you to introduce uh, Hugo Ebele, who will speak on constructive reverse mathematics of Gödel's completeness theorem. Uh, so um, I decided to hijack my talk uh, with uh, the discussion of from Monday to start. Uh, uh, the resistance of sunset, it will just be one slide, so don't worry. Uh, just to, so I'm coming from uh, essentially my work is around the, the computational content of proofs. So uh, let's say the query or work correspondent. So uh, what can we what can we know by looking at proof uh, from the computational content? How features from uh, computation from uh, programming can be used in in um, in proofs, and in particular side effect. I think uh, most of you should probably know that classical logic has a computational content, which is something called control operator. And somehow my work is related to this kind of things, how to analyze axioms from a, a computational point of view. And uh, when you analyze uh, um, uh, axioms from a computational point of view, uh, existence axiom or existence of set or uh, characteristic function of sets, you realize at some time, and this is, for instance, of use, as I will give the example of, bar, of uh, dependent choice, where maybe you, probably you know about recursion. So when you talk about the existence of, uh, of sets, you only promise um, uh, something about the observation of, uh, or let's, let, let's say it in another way, there is only one thing that you can observe, which are numbers, or more generally data types, boolean, trees, uh, sequence, what you can compute on your computer, the pixel, and so on. This is the only thing that you can, uh, so it's just a uh, manifest, a uh, personal manifest, it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not all the things that my own view and my own guide in, uh, in, uh, in seeing things, uh, but uh, the only thing you can observe are the, 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 the pixels, so basically, the natural numbers. And uh, uh, so if you assert the existence of, uh, of a finite set or a characteristic function, what do you say? You just say that you can observe it as, as far as you want, as far away as you want. Uh, if you have an infinite set, you can observe it or uh, uh, the 10,000 first uh, element or things like that. And I, in this view, I'm inspired by, by uh, so as I said, the computational content of uh, axiom of of dependent choice in the presence of classical logic, which is bar recursion, which basically says that there is no function of choice at all. The only thing that there is, is a process, a program, which is able to provide a, 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 an infinite sequence, a finite, a finite approximation of an infinite sequence, as long as we need to do. So this is somehow uh, my uh, <laughs> my small contribution to the discussion of uh, of Monday, and uh, I will uh, move to the to the talk. I, I, I have to prepare just because this is a workshop. It's a workshop about philosophy on reverse mathematics. So I understand it's it's good to uh, to to feed the discussion with uh, this kind of concept. Um, okay. Um, so I, I arrive to the work I'm presenting here uh, by uh, comparing uh, various results. So some of them, I saw them in the bo book of Steve's, uh, so which is where there is the central result of the connection between weak conic lemma and the, on the Gödel's completeness theorem. And uh, another trend of research, uh, which is uh, um, in constructive mathematics, uh, people are uh, doing uh, proof of completeness theorem not with respect to Tarski semantics, like in Gödel completeness, but with respect to Kripke or Bet semantic. And by using Kripke or Bet, somehow Bet is the most informative, but Bet, say, there are other semantic, face semantic, point-free topology, things like that. But with this richer semantics, they are able to produce a proof of completeness which are very structural. No enumeration, like in the proof, proof of Gödel, uh, uh, Gödel theorem, just uh, you take the, the model 
the universal model of context with uh, uh, the, the ordering of subset of uh, the subset ordering of context. And uh, this is the only structure you need. You don't need to order the, uh, the, the formula. In particular, the countability does not matter. And uh, it's very strange that when you have this richer structure, like in uh, Kripke or Betts model, uh, you can have very nice proof why we cannot do that uh, in, uh, for uh, Tarski semantics. So this was one of my, of my question. And uh, one of the reasons I started to look at uh, Enkin's proof. And, um, and somehow it's related, maybe in some sense, it's related to the question, uh, to the question of coding uh, mentioned uh, yesterday. Uh, in Enkin's proof, you need an enumeration of, uh, of formula. So you need something more in the sense of, uh, of content, <laughs> of proof content. Why do, can you avoid using an enumeration to prove Enkin's proof? Can we make a formal statement which said, if I want to prove Gödel's completeness with respect to Tarski semantic, I have no other choice than making an enumeration. This, this is the kind of question somehow which we can, which we can say, which we can ask. Why we can do with, with we do not, do not need that with, uh, with best uh, semantics, but we need it to, with the Tarski semantics. So are you trying to, like, to avoid the diagonalization theorem? Uh, no. So what, what, what is it about enumeration that, that's, um, that's key in, in, the, in the traditional proof? Uh, that if you want to, to build a model, you, you enumerate the formula to build the model step by step. This is what I mean. Well, in the, in the proof, for instance, in a richer semantics, you just need to, to say, uh, I take a universal model of crypto worlds, or, or for instance, uh, made of, uh, of context, with an order which is an inclusion of context, and this is enough. You, you never need to construct uh, okay. formally a completion of a model. So it's going to finite and infinite that you don't like. Yes, somehow. Yes, somehow it's countability versus non-countability. Yes. Um, on the, I mean, it's not that I like it or not. It's well, I mean, that's, uh, what you're, that's, it's, what you're, uh, that's what you're addressing, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry to put a value. <laughs> Um, on the, so, uh, goodness, goodness, uh, completeness theorem is, uh, is part of any classes, so it's, uh, so it's one of the most known uh, theorems. So, consequently, there are a large literature which is completely crazy. Uh, so. And, um, and uh, what is strange, so I, I hope I don't, uh, it's not a mistake to use the, more, the word reverse mathematics when uh, we consider uh, equivalence of uh, axioms in set theory. I mean, uh, because <coughs> there is an official reverse mathematics of second order arithmetic, but I guess it's okay if we extend the, the name to uh, constructive reverse mathematics or. Uh, uh, all the work with what's done with axiom of choice and for strengths of axiom of choice in set theory is a kind of reverse mathematics. And uh, then, uh, Gödel's completeness has this particularity that it is studied in classical reverse mathematics, in intuitionistic reverse mathematics, in set theory, in, in arithmetic, and in each case we have a different result. So what, how to, to sort out that? Um, so, um, in the, so, I made three kind of works about Gödel completeness. I will present only the first one. Um, I, um, I also work on the constructive contents of Enkin's proof, which is quite uh, interesting because there is somehow a, 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 a global thinking that uh, good, uh, Enkin's proof is classical, but there is a way to make it constructive and to compute with it. By computing with it, I mean you take a proof of validity and from it you get a proof of derivability. It's, it's quite strange, but uh, I think it's amazing. It's worked by continuation passing style in terms of program, programming. And uh, I'm working also on another, on another thing. So as I said, classical logic can be seen as a side effect. Uh, it's no, no problem to reason classically for us, uh, A or not A, even if we don't compute directly the uh, uh, side of the disjunction, uh, the side A or the side not A, but we know we can compute in the, we can compute with it in the sense that if I have eventually I see a sigma zero one formula, I can use my decision of A or not A to compute this sigma zero one formula 
And this computational content is what I said, delimited control and something from, from programming. But uh, uh, there are other, uh, other kind of side effects in programming, for instance, memory assignment. You have a memory and you change its value and then you change uh, uh, this value another time. On this, uh, you can put it in correspondence with the forcing. The forcing is you have, a, you have a, a condition that you update and you can think that this forcing condition has a memory which is uh, in the forcing translation it's explicit but you can think at it as a global variable also on the, um, on the, that you update invisibly without expressing it explicitly in the time. And if you do this thing, you have a strange thing is that you take the crypture translation of Gödel's theorem and what you get is if you take the forcing crypture translation, so forcing intuitionistic forcing translation of Gödel's completeness theorem, you translate it And what you get, you get a statement for crypto completeness, for completeness with respect to crypto semantics. But then, with completeness with crypto semantics, you have access to the context, to the ambient context. And then uh, you can do the same thing as what you do with classical logic. Classical logic, you can see it as a side effect, uh, as a, you can see it as a programming construct, um, and, which is related, by the way, to the double negation translation. <coughs> Uh, or, uh, so you can see it implicitly as a programming, or you can see it explicitly via the double translation, the double negation translation. Then you could do the same with forcing. You have the forcing translation. You can see it as a forcing translation. So you have a statement to throw you, by forcing you obtain something and you validate it. But you can say, oh, since for classical logic I have both, I have the double negation translation and I have the direct sign with h total middle from the logical point of view. Continuation passes uh, uh, control daily, control operator from the programming point of view. I can do the same thing with forcing and not only consider the forcing transition, but what the forcing transition would be in a direct style without mentioning it. And this is exactly a memory. So there is a way, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit <laughs> cheating in some sense, but it's no more cheating than using classical logic when classical logic can be interpreted to intuitionistic logic by double, double translation negation, it's no more cheating than that. If you take the forcing translation and you forget about the forcing translation and instead you take a global memory. And if you do that, you get a proof of Gödel's completeness, which does not need an enumeration. Okay, it's just adverti advertising because I will not talk about this. I will not talk about the second point. I will talk only on the first point, which is analyzing the literature about the completeness theorem regarding reverse mathematics on this, on trying to sort out what, uh, what it says. Um, so here is, a, so it's not an exhaustive list, but here is a list of statements about completeness. So and many of them are contradictory. Uh, so there is a, the standard one by Simpson. I didn't know the date because in the book it's written personal work of the author, but I don't see a date. So. Uh, so Kreisel is one. Uh, yes, the point of that. Uh, so Kreisel is one of those uh, who, is, who try to look at, at completeness proof from an intuitionistic point of view, but, and it observes that oh, we need Markov principle. Markov principle, which is just double negation elimination for sigma zero one formula. So first surprise somehow. Uh, after that, uh, uh, there were two proofs. Which were, so it was not for Tarski semantics, it was for uh, semantics, because at this time, people uh, uh, looking at things in an intuitionistic uh, way was uh, considering more uh, completeness with respect to intuitionistic logic, because uh, they, they, were, uh, they were biased to use intuitionistic logic, so they were looking at intuitionistic proof of intuitionistic logic. And the, and the same apply for an intuitionistic proof of completeness of intuitionistic logic, you need Markov principle. So, uh, Harvey is one of those who contributed uh, in, this, uh, in this field, and uh, Wim Bellman uh, contributed also a proof, uh, one for best model, the other for a crypto model, and, um, and they fix the Markov principle problem by changing the interpretation of false, of the false connective. So, first remark, The interpretation of false has an impact on the constructiveness of the way you compute, uh, the way you, uh, uh, you compute with, uh, with uh, the net completeness theorem. 
and as a way on the strength from a constructive point of view, from a constructive reverse mathematic point of view. So this is what fallible models on Hpool did not, it's synonyms, it's two, it's two different proofs with the different terminology, but it just means that false, the false connective is not interpreted in the standard way, it's interpreted as an arbitrary formula. And uh, uh, then, so it's not in order, it's not in chronological order, but in uh, 96, and this was also Krivin, uh, Jean-Louis Krivin is in Paris here, and uh, he's uh, 82 and still working, <laughs> uh, still emerit, emeritus. Um, and uh, I was also uh, uh, influenced by his work. He made a purely intuitionistic proof of, of Gödel's completeness with respect, oh, I don't wrote it, but with respect to Tarski models. How did he do? Uh, it was simple, if you look inside, there were no, no false connectives. <laughs> this is the way he, he solved the problem. He had only as connective implication on fall. This result uh, was quite interesting, and, um, and um, I will skip to, to this line, Berardi. So this was studied a, a bit after. And uh, Berardi, and Valentini at some time, uh, established that, uh, something which refines some of what Kreisel did, that uh, uh, any proof of Gödel's completeness with respect to Tarski semantics with either disjunction or the standard interpretation of false, and disjunction with the standard interpretation of disjunction also, is necessarily not constructive, not, not provable in pure intuitionistic logic. So, okay, what's, the, what's the difference between HA2 on top and HA2 on top? Ah, okay. Uh, I, okay, by HA2 on the, on the bottom, I mean a second order quantification polymorphic, a subsystem of second order arithmetic with quantification of our predicates. By HA with two on the, on the top, on the above, I mean quantification of our function of our uh, natural numbers, or function of our natural numbers on, on the Boolean number. Boolean. Um, on the WKV is a weak case. Uh, which clean uh, Wesley logic. Um, okay, so interesting result, which uh, we will confirm. And um, okay, then I see I skipped Christoph, which is uh, recently, so there were quite a lot of, of works also recently. Uh, and the Christoph uh, formalized, uh, 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 check that indeed uh, we need uh, the fan theorem uh, for completeness with respect to base model. So another um, another result which is very strange, we, which probably we should study more because it still looks quite strange to me. But that if you reason in intuition in the constructive intuitionistic logic where fan theorem is expressed with function, or at least in the language with function then which fan theorem is equivalent to fan theorem? <coughs> so this is a bit strange. I still don't, I still don't understand well why, actually. Uh, then there is another uh, trend of research, which this time is in ZF. In ZF, McCarthy proves that we can prove much more than Markov principle. We can prove full uh, excluded middle from completeness. Well, how is it possible? How is, does it, is it compatible with what said before? Uh, it's just that here, what matters, it's not the collective, it's the, the conditions that we put on the, on the, on the theory. Uh, if the theory is uh, uh, recursively enumerable, then we can only derive Markov principle. But if we take an arbitrary theory, you can encode it in ether any uh, kind of, um, of uh, classical statement on using on use completeness to, uh, <laughs> by composing with soundness and completeness, to re-inject this classical uh, statement, um, uh, to show that you can infer it. So then this is another kind of, uh, of observation, this one by Matt Carty. Um, so in ZF, we have also that there is a correspondence between completeness 
on the variant of the ultra filter theorem, so the prime ideal theorem for Boolean algebra. Uh, so how is it possible? I think so obviously because uh, uh, ultra filter or uh, the ultra filter theorem or the prime ideal theorem for uh, for countable sets is the same as the weak Koenig lemma. Something which is not, which I think should be obvious, but which is not often clearly stated in the literature. I think it's very little place where you can find it. So I'm, I would be curious to discuss about what is the, the, the folklore about, about this. Um, and, um, and correspondingly to this, Bernardi, Berardi and Valentini, uh, who were studying uh, Krivin's proof, from Krivin's proof, they, 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 they develop a proof, an intuitionistic proof, of something which is supposed to be independent of the F, but they, they develop uh, a, a constructive proof of the prime ideal theorem uh, for, uh, in the countable case. Um, uh, so, which is consistent with, uh, with uh, the fact that the, the, the prime ideal theorem countable is, uh, is weak Koenig lemma. Or even uh, if you formulate it good enough, is the contrapositive of weak Koenig lemma, which is a weak fan theorem. Ah, I think I don't, didn't say that. That weak FT is a weak fan theorem, which is a contrapositive of weak um, But there is a trick. They don't use a disjunction. They use implication to implement disjunction, if I remember well. So they avoid the problem. Uh, they, they avoid the problem mentioned here that if you have disjunction, you need something classical. And then uh, there is a recent work by uh, Espindola uh, where uh, he shows that exactly Gödel's completeness is excludal middle on the ultra filter theorem. But as you have guessed, he has weak excludal middle because he accepts theories which are not recursively enumerable as its standard, and he has the prime ideal theorem because he allows a, a countable, uncountable theories, a, a, a theories of arbitrary cardinal. And the uh, uh, last thing I want to mention, <coughs> which uh, made me a headache at some, at some time, is that uh, in some <laughs> works, you see that Koenig's lemma is independent of ZF. And it seems, as far as I understand, that the, the question is what, is mean, what it means to be two, to be a two element set. Is it to be a pair or a couple? <laughs> is it to be an order pair or a non-order pair? And if you, I hope someone can, can confirm what, uh, what, what was my conclusion, but if you state Koenig's lemma or weak Koenig's lemma by saying, uh, I'm not uh, making a choice between zero and one, but I'm making a choice in a two element sense, in a two element set, without giving an order, then uh, you get the, uh, the strength of a choice axiom. Like the socks on the shoes, uh, the parallel, the Brussels shoes and socks. And if you want to choose, to, to, to choose, you, 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 you know that? You, yeah. Huh? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so this is a bit surprising, but sometimes it makes com communication difficult with, uh, with different communities. Okay, so let's, let's go. I think basically this is uh, all is in, is in this slide. I will go into the details afterwards. Um, um, so before going fully into the details, I will uh, make a bit of advertising also. <laughs> Um, uh, so this is the basic. Uh, the, yes, this this slide. In this slide, I try to uh, <laughs> to superpose, to superimpose what three different communities are telling about choice action. So in blue, you have the set theory. What people in set theory says. Or set theory, so if we move away a trust form of uh, lemma, uh, they don't see double UK, of course, because it's a theorem. If you take so set theory is, is blind about what is below this. Then you, you have the standard uh, result that AC has two principal, two important consequences, the ultra filter, 
uh, theorem on the dependent choice, which are both weaker and independent. Uh, so, um, and this is where completeness uh, uh, is from the point of view of set theory. Then uh, we have uh, reverse mathematics of uh, subsystem of second order arithmetic, where completeness lives here with with Koenig's lemma, and uh, because with Koenig's lemma is a consequence of uh, the countable form of uh, ultra filter theorem. And then you have a, a set, a bunch of uh, of uh, results uh, in reverse mathematics in constructive arithmetic, and uh, so it was in the first after Brouwer, so Brouwer uh, set uh, so this fan theorem, the bar, bar induction, and uh, there were quite a lot of work to understand how this fan theorem and far bar induction uh, uh, and how bar induction was uh, uh, was connected to uh, axiom of axiom of dependent choice on WPL. And uh, this interesting picture, so this picture is interesting, and uh, then it's an ad, I said it's an advertisement, advertisement. Uh, but there is a way to represent this picture in a uniform way. So there is a statement, we call it generalized dependent choice. It's a statement in three parameters, uh, a domain A, a codomain B, and some kind of filter, a predicate, uh, over the approximate, the finite approximation of function from A to B. And this generalized uh, <coughs> dependent choice has the property that when you instantiate A, the domain with a natural number, you, 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 you fall in dependent choice. When you instantiate the codomain with a, a Boolean, you, you fall on ultra filter theorem. When you instantiate the domain with natural number and the codomain with uh, with a natural number yes. on codomain with boolean, of course you you fall in the intersection with, which is WPL. And uh, and uh, if you take you leave A and B arbitrary, so then there is a strange thing that you get an inconsistent <laughs> statement. But if you take A and B arbitrary and you restrict it to a, a notion of filter, which is characterized only by this element of size one, by the approximation of size one, you have something which is equivalent to AC. So like, uh, so size one is like, you are, there is this notion in set theory of properties of finite, uh, no, uh, set, uh, yes, property of, I forgot the name, sorry. Um, and uh, somehow this is uh, also a consequence of this, this work is also a consequence of looking at completeness, so which is a very good, uh, very good guide to, to, to confronting different uh, schools, and this is very good. Okay, this I said. So then, uh, now the rest of uh, my talk, I will, uh, it's structure like this. So uh, with uh, all this statement, I will make what uh, five clarifications, <laughs> which I al already said orally, but which more in the details, uh, how, uh, why we have these different results. So then the first one is, uh, is the, content, the, the size of the theory. So I think, so from now on, after this slide, we will, remain, we will stay with the countable theory. Um, so the second clarification is the need for a Markov principle. So as I said, uh, it's related to, uh, to the question of bottom. If you don't have bottom in the theory, you don't, in the, in the logic, you, don't have, you have just a logic without bottom. It's a bit, there are things you cannot express for fully, but um, uh, instead of uh, classical logic, for instance, you have to take Pierce law or things like that. But uh, assume you don't have a uh, bottom, uh, then there is no problem. Uh, you, don't, you don't get, uh, no problem to be purely intuitionistic. You don't get uh, Markov. And uh, there is an interesting remark to do, that these two interpretations of, 
so and you can fix it. You can fix it by changing the interpretation of bottom, the way uh, it was done by Harvey and the way it was done by Lynn Bellman in the case of crypto bet and crypto semantics, which is to interpret differently the false by saying false doesn't mean false in the meta language, but means an arbitrary formula. And what is interesting is that if we look under this, uh, and especially linear logic, so intuitionistic logic can be seen as a decomposition, as a pre more primitive decomposition of classical logic, and linear logic can be seen as an even more primitive decomposition of intuitionistic logic. So it has two, two conjunctions, two disjunctions, and it has also two bottoms. There is a bottom which is written uh, zero, which is a neutral element, or element of the of a disjunction which is written like this. And this disjunction is exactly the intuitive one, the one uh, you prove A or B because either A or B. On the you have bottom another false connective in near logic, which is a neutral element of a disjunction which is which is called with this reverse ampersand, uh, which is called par. On the the, so they have different introduction rule. Uh, this one, it has no introduction rule. So this is the one we like, uh, with, which, with which we do consistency proof. Oh, I have normalization of my proof. Uh, I, have a, I have a statement which is zero, so bot this bottom. I have no introduction rule, so my theory is consistent. This, uh, this other bottom is not, uh, uh, does not support this kind of reasoning. It has an elimination rule. And uh, uh, or, or left introduction rule, if you see it in separate calculus, and an introduction rule. So this one you can think at it actually as a dual of the of the top formula. There is some more. What's Markov principle here? Uh, Markov principle is uh, the, uh, the the double negation of uh, is still that the double negation elimination for sigma zero one formula. Um, and then the, we can rephrase the, 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 the fact that we, you can interpret uh, bottom in the standard way or in the exploding way, like Friedman and, and Feldman, as different bottom. It's either you interpret it as a zero of linear logic or as a bottom of linear logic. And only the zero of the of, uh, of linear logic is problematic. And more generally, this is a, a claim a, something that we will see. So you know, so connectives are split into positive and negative connectives. So this one zero is a positive. It's like the plus, like the existential, and all on the other are negative. And the, the problematic connective, the one which break it, the the constructive content, are the positive connectives. And it's related also why best models are better than crypto models. That's another story. Okay. So the third clarification, I, I also explain how arrive at Schrödinger middle. It's just uh, because uh, it, it depends on the logical complexity of, uh, of the theory. So be careful. There are interactions between all these parameters. This, you need also a zero. You need also a false connective interpreted, uh, uh, interpreted the standard way. Otherwise, you cannot derive this. So we start to think, oh, it's very complicated, this thing. Is this, uh, is this really worse to look at this? Uh, it's so much complicated. You have so much combination of parameters in this proof. But still, it's completely theorem. It's not so, so absurd that there is uh, this, uh, this diversity because it connects something which is semantic with syntax. So it has, it's, uh, it has this, uh, this interrelation. Okay, so uh, let's uh, look at, at the uh, fourth point. Um, uh, why here, why here we, have, we, we add, uh, sometimes we, we, why we don't need a formally W Double uh, which fan theorem, the contrapositive of <laughs> conic lemma here, 
why do we need it here? Okay, I explained also it's related to the disjunction, but let's make this, let's make this more precise. Can you remind me what the weak band theorem is? Yes, uh, it's uh, so I will give a formal statement, but intuitively it's just a contrapositive of uh, of uh, weak uh, Koenigsegg map. So from a classical point of view, it's the same as weak Koenigsegg map, but it's formulated in the in the contrapositive way. Which, which he says, if uh, it's, uh, it's a terminology of bar, so if, uh, uh, if a tree is barred, uh, you, or, or maybe another way to express it is that you have two, two ways to define well-foundedness. You can say something is well-founded because you know, a tree, that a tree is well-founded. Either because uh, for all sequ infinite sequences, uh, it will uh, stabilize, or you can say that inductively it's well-founded because uh, 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 because I'm out of the tree, or because every step I made, I will recursively be well-funded. So there are two definitions of well-funded. On the fan theorem, it's exactly saying that if I have, if I have, if I am well-funded um, relatively to uh, uh, observing infinite sequences, how it behaves with infinite sequences, then I am inductively well-funded. This is fan theorem. Uh, okay, so I hope you will not find that I'm doing some ideology by uh, defending uh, constructive logic, but uh, uh, I will present constructive logic then as a refinement of classical logic, more informative. So more informative means also I need to, to take more care because I will, there will be different exists, there will be much more different notion of to be finite and so on and so on. Uh, so the difference, the main difference then is uh, that uh, exist on the so the positive connective exists on this function have what I what I call the intuitive meaning that if an existential is to provide uh, a witness. So it's like the discussion on Monday we were talking about existence of sets, <laughs> but we were thinking at existence of sets in an in an intuitive meaning that the sets exist, I can I can show it, I can point it. So this is the existential, the, intu the intuitionistic uh, meaning of existential. Uh, I have a witness on the proof that the witness is correct. Contrastingly, in classical logic, because there is a, the, the pseudal middle, when I'm saying as there exist, or when I'm saying I have a proof of disjunction, in practice, it doesn't mean that there is one side is chosen or one witness is obtained, basically it means there is no contradiction to assume the existence. Or there is no contradiction to assume that one side or the other of the disjunction is, uh, is here. So it's a weaker, uh, it's a weaker uh, statement. So in this sense, uh, classical logic is a logic where you have only this connective and this connective. While constructive logic as an extra connective, which is exist and or with their intuitive meaning. And you can say, here I have a witness, or you can say that, something you cannot say in classical logic. And then this is why I say the existence of set in classical logic does not mean the same as in intuitionistic logic. It means absence of contradiction of assuming the existence. Uh, I don't find I'm talking a lot. 20 minutes at least. Um, 20 minutes at least. <laughs> okay. Uh, so here I'm showing one of the typical, uh, typical, uh, <laughs> it's not, zoo is not the right term, but uh, typical uh, uh, gra graphical, graphic of uh, implication in, uh, uh, in, um, in intuitionistic logic. Uh, so uh, you have the low excludal of excludal middle. You can consider uh, De, Morgan's, De Morgan's law. And uh, if you consider it on, uh, by restricting the class of formula uh, on which you apply them, then you get this kind of cube, uh, which is quite common. I mean, if you look at the constructive mathematics uh, in the tradition of, uh, of Brouwer, 
uh, Bishop, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, this is typical uh, statement. So LPO, less uh, limited principle of omniscience, LLPO, which is a part of WQL, so the, lim the lesser limited principle of omniscience, and so on. So I, I will not comment more, just to say that LLPO is important because it's related from the efficiency point of view to WQL. Then you have uh, another kind of interesting statement, which are uh, classical, which are uh, no problem classically. Which, so the famous Markov principle, so I, I mentioned, so which I, I, I restate. And another one, which is double negation shift. Uh, so double negation shift, uh, somehow it's well known for, for Glivenko theorem. Glivenko theorem says that uh, if you have a classical proof, you have, you have, then you have uh, an intuitive proof of the double negation of the, of the, of the same statement. So this is a theorem for propositional logic. And if you want to extend it to predicate logic, then what you need is exactly the double negation shift. You see? So the double negation shift is the same as saying Levenko applies, the Levenko theorem applies to, uh, to uh, predicate logic. And um, uh, because uh, um, we consider interpretation of false, uh, which are not standard, which are uh, interpreted by any formula, I consider also a generalized uh, version of double negation shift, where the negation is replaced by uh, an implication to any formula. So this is exactly the, the consequence of not interpreting false as a, as a false of the meta language, but uh, as an arbitrary formula. And here we take sigma zero one formula. We follow this frame that I highlighted in the first slide. That what you can observe. The equivalent of a data type in programming, the equivalent of a pixel on the screen here in the physical world is a sigma zero one formula, a closed sigma zero one formula. This closed sigma zero one formula are the things you can observe, you can compute, the things which return an integer or a pixel. Um, uh, alors, so what is important with this scheme? While the previous one here, these, these schemes, did, do, does not preserve, do not preserve the, uh, the intuitionistic meaning of disjunction on it exists. An important point of this three scheme is that this one preserves the, the disjunction on a, a existential property. For instance, uh, Markov is, you, so you know, there is three, three schools of, of constructive mathematics. One of them is a Markov school which accepts this principle and the argument is to say it preserves, it preserves the, the intuitive meaning of disjunction on existential, so why not to have it? And DNS is another one which preserves the, 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 the disjunction on existence uh, meaning of, uh, of this connected. But then another point is that you, we know exactly how to compute with them in a better way than what I mentioned before, which is a control operator, we have a very simple uh, computational content for this principle. So the most, the most, uh, the oldest one is a, is a Kleene's realization of Markov principle. Kleene's shows that Markov principle is realizable. You just have to, you just have a while loop. So you have a sigma zero one statement. You look if p zero is true. If not, you look p one and so on. And with a meta classical argument, you know that this cannot end forever because you have not not of this, and, uh, and you finally find the weakness. There are other uh, interpretations close to dialectical interpretation, for instance, with exception. Um, and uh, on DNS, on the other side, the standard way to compute with it is bar recursion, so which was used to give a dialectical interpretation of, uh, of uh, as the axiom of dependent choice in the presence of classical logic. And uh, uh, Danko Illich, who was working with me, uh, made a, an alternative interpretation um, 10 years ago uh, using uh, a, a, a variant of uh, control operators, which we call delimited control. And uh, um, which a priori, 
scale to, to uncountable domain. So, I mean, here it's natural number, but recursion works when this is uh, uh, countable. And a priori, this should give a computational content to DNS even when it's not countable. That's another story. Um, da -da, da -da. I put a remark also that DNS is trivial when A is negative, because in this case, uh, it commutes. So the important instance are when it's disjunction, when A is a disjunction or an extension. Okay, keep in mind this DNS because this will be the, what characterizes the disjunction, the disjunction in the presence of the object language. So when you have, we have seen that when you have the false connective, it implies Markov principle. Then when you have the disjunction connective, it will imply DNS. So these are the two important principles for completeness proof. <coughs> and again, interestingly, these are the two which preserve the two among the collection of intuitionist principles, which preserve the disjunction on existence properties. Okay, so now, now something which we have to observe just only because uh, there are different communities of reverse mathematics which use, we use a different language. And if we try to connect the language, we arrive to the observation that actually there are three formulations of weak Kanitsema constructively and three formulations of uh, weak fan theorem constructively, depending on how you represent a set. Actually, so basically, there are three ways to represent the set. I, I mean, it's a, I'm, tri, I'm saying triviality, but uh, it, it took me a time, a, some time to understand that people were seemingly saying the same thing, but using different definitions. So, uh, I don't know if it's related to the question of coding. Uh, somehow, I don't know. Uh, so, um, then, what is a set? A set of natural numbers. So, the first way, uh, so, so, first to make the difference, we need to reason, and this is related to the question of what is, uh, what is the, the, the two here, the two on the top and the two on the bottom, to be able to compare them, you need the two on the top and on the bottom. So you need to, to live in a meta logic, in a meta language, in a formal language, where you have both Boolean, both Boolean and proposition. So uh, I don't know if you made some formalization, some proof assistance or things like that, but you know, or in type theory, you know that we, in type theory we give a name to the set of proposition. It's called prop, usually. So I will use this name. In set theory, it's implicit. Uh, instead of talking about the set of proposition, uh, we use uh, uh, we formally use the power set. But uh, it's a, it's a way to it's a way to say the same thing. So then, a subset of natural number can be formalized <laughs> trivially uh, as a, as a, what we could we would call a set uh, in uh, in Simpson in uh, Steve Simpson book, which is a function from natural number. To proposition, to any proposition, to any num numbers, I assign a formula, which is the, the, the corresponding, uh, which is a predicate with with uh, one free variable, which is this uh, this parameter. But you can think, I will skip directly to here. You can think of a set as a characteristic function, which tell you for each element if the element is in the set or not. This is a Boolean information. So classically, eventually, classically, prop and bool are the same because uh, propositions are decidable. So you can always associate to a proposition a Boolean which witness, which is its characteristic function. But constructively, you cannot do this, uh, this uh, correspondence. Constructively, you have to, to keep a difference between prop and bool. Be, being a, pro, a predicate with one variable or being the characteristic function of a predicate with one variable. And in, the, in between, I think if we look closely at, at how it's formalized in Steve Simpson book, there is another way to represent a, a, a function. Uh, so, no. Um, it's more in. 
Mm. It's more related to okay. Not, not let's let's forget about Simpson's book, but there is another way which is to rep to represent it as a function, such a function, but not using bool, using prop. That means as a functional relation. This is yet another way to represent a set. As a functional relation, that is as a function represent as a function represented as a relation, as a pair of natural number on Boolean value, which is uh, functional at any the end, there is only only one B which corresponds. Equivalently, from the constructive point of view, this is the same as saying that the predicate is decidable. So these three different uh, definitions, classically, it's the same. So no problem from the classical point of view. But constructively, then it's different. And then constructively, this means that there is three kinds of comprehension actions, which are, which are different. And most of the time, constructive reverse mathematicians are using this implicitly. While we, when you reason <laughs> Intuitionistic, in the intuitionistic fragment of reverse mathematics, you would naturally more use that. And this is typically what Krivin did. Krivin was using this representation, while in the other proof, constructive proof, they were using this representation. And the diff and DNS is part of the story between the two. Okay, obviously, when you, there is a hierarchy between them, if you have the characteristic function, you can reconstruct the functional relation. And if you have the functional relation, you can forget, uh, you can, uh, no, you cannot forget, but uh, you can, uh, you can get a predicate. So this is the, this is the function. But to go the reverse way, to go from a predicate, arbitrary predicate, without any assumption on its decidability, you need the law of excludal middle. This is the law of excludal middle with, which turns the, prop, the proposition into a Boolean. And additionally, if you want to go to a function, you need a unit choice, uh, a unit choice uh, principle. So, which is very strange classically also, and it's set theory, it's a very strange because we don't need that, but uh, if you go to topos theory, for instance, you will have, have it also. Okay, so you have, we have three different types. Then let's look um, at uh, what it implies uh, on uh, the formulation of uh, of fan theorem and the uh, weak Kanitz lemma. But first, first, uh, Let's uh, remind a few words in the last 20 years on analyzing uh, Koenig's lemma and Fan theorem in terms of classical logic. So Ishihara proved that WQL has a purely intuitionistic uh, for, uh, part on a classical part. The classical part is this uh, LLPO, the so Morgan for sigma 0, 1 formula. On the uh, uh, purely Purely choice parts, which happen to be a dependent choice for, uh, for Booleans, basically. And then uh, Joseph Berger uh, uh, show that this decomposition translate to the fan theorem. So fan theorem is, is a contrapositive form of Wittgenstein's lemma, but happens to be weaker intuitionistically. And he designed L fan, a C fan, which is uh, the classical part of fan theorem on the on a purely uh, choice part. Um, so, then here are the statement of fan theorem. So, uh, it's start to be quite technical. Uh, I think uh, it start to be technical maybe to enter the, the, the formulation. Uh, but basically, it's what I said informally uh, to your question. So it's uh, if I have a, if I have a predicate. Uh, so it's not presented as a as a well-founded order. So I use the well-foundedness of order as a more intuitive way. But here you have a tree. You, you have a tree, a binary tree. 
So these are the sequence of Boolean, finite sequence of Boolean. And if uh, for all uh, infinite sequence, uh, at some point, you hate, so it's a tree or rather you, you have to think about it, the way it's formulated, as an anti-tree, as a negative image of a tree. So it's, you don't have the tree, you have the outside of the tree. So if for any function at some point you enter the outside of the tree, then there is a uniform bond, a uniform bond sorry, on, uh, on, the, on the tree, on the, on the tree in which, uh, to, to, uh, from which you go outside the tree. And you have this tree formulation depending on whether f is a function to bool, r is a relation, functional relation, or x is, is, a, is a subset. So then uh, there is this, this little more complicated themes. If it's a function, it's easy to, to consider the approximation. You just keep the n first element. If you have a proposition, uh, then you have to explain what it means to, for a sequence, finite sequence of Boolean to be, to reflect a predicate. So the, the, the definition is a bit more complicated, but you have uh, this notion of approximation, which says that a finite sequence of, of Boolean is a, is an approximation of the n first value of a, of a proposition. So this is formally defined like this. But, uh, so it's a bit complicated somehow, but this statement is much weaker than this one. This one is purely intuitionistic, no classical logic at all, while these two have a classical part. Uh, so then if we, if we use uh, this, consequences, or for these non-consequences, these consequences, then we deduce that, indeed, the, the fan theorem used by constructive uh, people is stronger than the fan theorem implicitly used when you reason in second order arithmetic. Uh, so classically, they are equivalent. And, uh, the conclusion, I already said on the first slide, but on the, on the page, on the long list, the, uh, this one is enough for the completeness proof in the absence of disjunction, but with disjunction, you need this one. And this is basically the result. Uh, so it's not, uh, I, I didn't succeed yet. <laughs> There are many intricacies depending on the surrounding of the logic. You need to have four holes so that it applies, or you have countable theories. So there are many parameters I don't manage well, but eventually the, the, the conjecture is that you will get this also, that this, the difference between the two, the one which is enough in the absence of disjunction and the one you need for disjunction is DNS. And that even if the present, the formulation is quite different in the decomposition of Josef Berger, uh, eventually I'm pretty sure it will, uh, will have this. So then, uh, okay, I already, this is a summary, but I already said orally many times. All, all the bare logic, just because you can make completeness proof also the bare logic without any connectives and using a, a Scott entailment Collision, for instance, it's a way to, um, to make logic without connectives. Um, propositional logic. Uh, but the negative connective, and in particular for, for the false, you need the negative form, which is the linear logic bottom, not the zero. It requires only the predicative form of which fan theorem, while zero. Uh, brings Markov principle and more generally uh, exclude the middle of size S for a theory of logical complexity S. So this is the conclusion of, uh, of, the, of the analysis that the disjunction additionally requires some form of DNS. So DNS T if we don't have the zero or DNS if we have the zero. Um, Okay, and surprisingly exists, even though it's positive, does not seem to require more. I still don't understand well why. Okay, I think. Ah, I have the fifth clarification. Yes. 
There are several, okay, but I, I'm, I'm basically done. Uh, there are different ways also to think at completeness theorem. In set theory, it's common to see it as consistent implies a model, and the constructive strength is different. Uh, if you, so what I was talking about most is uh, the valid implies provable form. If you take the consistent implies as a model form, then what you get is that you don't need any more Markov principle in the presence of, uh, of uh, the false connective. But when the, when the false connective on the disjunction connective at there, you get the, uh, the Morgan's law for the class of formula S, which, uh, which depending on the theory, okay. If, you, if your theory is of logical complexity S, then you get, uh, you get the Morgan's law for this theory. Which is amazing. So I'm working with uh, Dominic Kirst in Saarbrücken. So they formalized, they have a big, uh, big library of undecidability proof formalizing code, which is very nice. With formal result, or many results of reverse mathematics, they have formalized code. Um, okay. That's it. Very much, Google. Oops, um, any questions? Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, let's we'll take the question in the room first, and then, or, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, so this is kind of a methodological question. Um, so you said that of the uh, three fan ones, that uh, one that intuitionist. That, uh, tend to use, but, and it's not the one that we do in intuitionistic reverse mathematics. Uh, so, like, why do like is that the obvious choice in the intuitionistic case? Ah, okay. Uh, so, um, in uh, the intuitionistic community, there is a um, there is a big debate about <laughs> predicativity of second order quantification. Uh, uh, so for some constructive people, second order uh, quantification is no problem. <laughs> but uh, for a lot of them, it's a problem. So they don't want to consider uh, prop, what I call prop. They don't want to consider what we would call set. They just want function. So they would just want to manipulate uh, characteristic functions or sets. But they don't want to be able to define uh, another, an object or a predicate by quantification over a collection which would include itself. They don't want it. This is why, generally, I think uh, they, they consider characteristic function rather than predicates. Great, thank you. <laughs> Happy. Yeah, okay. Uh, go ahead, Harvey. Oh, oops. Hi. 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 So, anyways, I, uh, I was aware of the possibility of having uh, reverse math for the constructive math, and I didn't really pursue it much, but I'm wondering overall, with, with regular uh, reverse math, one has this enormous body of material to reverse, namely a good chunk of, if not all, ultimately, of actual mathematics that's done. Now, the amount of constructive mathematics or intuitionistic mathematics that's done is not of the same size. And so I wonder what you, what your expectations are in terms of the scope and size of, uh, of the reverse math of intuitionistic math, or reverse intuitionistic math. So this is a question. Uh, so personally, I'm not consider myself as an intuitionistic reverse mathematician, just, uh, I'm just uh, op uh, I'm just observing what is done. Uh, so there is a small community uh, which started to use officially a term reverse mathematics around uh, Wim Bildman um, and uh, and uh, Ishiara, Josef Berger, uh, and uh, a few people. Uh, somehow, this is also related to us uh, from uh, from Thierry Coquin, uh, who is a mathemati constructive mathematician and uh, 
So it does not it does not look at things in a, in the point of view of reversal, but uh, it looks uh, at it considers standard statement of uh, mat classical mathematics and see uh, how to reformulate them uh, a different coding, uh, let's say, of the statement, so that uh, uh, you need uh, it's it's uh, it falls in a weaker constructive uh, theory or it falls in a constructive uh, theory. Uh, like, for instance, you probably know his claim that uh, many statements of classical mathematics are about choice function, the existence of choice function, that if you just formulate it by, uh, in an int by, exhibit by not asking a choice function, but uh, a process to build intentionally a function, so exactly the difference I was saying between inductively well-funded or uh, well, fund, well uh, observationally well funded. Uh, that, so there is this work by, Th by Thierry Cocon which goes in this direction to, to put explicit in mathematical statement places where, we, you, where you, you assert the existence of a set, but in, if, you formulate, if you would formulate it in another way, you wouldn't need to assert an existence of a set, you would just have an intentional process. I, you, you, feel, you, you see what I mean? Or like, um, um, so I, I don't know enough. Well, you're, you're talking about uh, uh, his way of recasting classical mathematics. Yes, yes, as yes. You change. A, yes, you change a statement which up to up to an axiom of choice of or up to a comprehension axiom. It's classic. It's classically the same statement. So from the classical point of view, it should be the same statement, but from the constructive point of view, it's a, it's a statement which become constructive. I mean, I, is this in the direction of saying that uh, constructive mathematics therefore is at least as large as classical mathematics and therefore reverse constructive mathematics is at least as large as regular RM? Uh... Well, they have like intuitionistic Ramsey theory, for example. I mean, you just said that. I would agree with that. Just say yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> or if you say so. I, I didn't yeah, I catch the words. Just say if you say so. Okay. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> yeah, that's intuitionically true. <laughs> are, are you happy, Harvey? We have another question in the room, if that's okay. Uh, I'm happy to stop. I'm not necessarily completely understanding the consequences of this suggestion. So, but I'm happy to leave the floor, uh, give up the floor. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Hugo, for this. So just one quick question. Could you go back to the true definition of uh, uh, subsets of N? So, what may feel a bit weird, yeah, here. Uh, is that you said that the, uh, the last two layers do collapse if you have uh, the law of excluded middle, right? Yes. Uh, but you also said that from a classical point of view, they are the same. So one could expect that if you add uh, the law of excluded middle, you should uh, get that the free definition collapse, but you don't get that. But so maybe. <laughs> Sorry? So maybe you could give an explanation, and then I have a I, I have a second question. So can you just uh, go for a few slides? And maybe let him answer your first question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, what, you want this to collapse in? So you said that the by collapse I mean they become equivalent. Exactly. Yeah. But you, you also said that if you add the excluded middle, you only get that two are equivalent, right? Then that's the, the slide right after. So these two become equivalent. Yes, exactly. Well, one could expect that if they are all classically equivalent, that if you are to add, to add the law of excluded middle, they should all become equivalent, right? Uh, but, but the third one requires some choice, additional choice, which is not classical. Okay. 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 I mean, uh, it's, technically, it depends what you mean by this, uh, but uh, uh, technically, there is, a, there is an extra axiom to go from this to this, which is mm -hmm. the axiom of unit choice, and I suspect that this is the reason why, uh, uh, why Iris Lub is able to prove that which fan theorem is equivalent to fan theorem, 
because of the, the axiom of the choice, but uh, I didn't confirm. Yeah. And you have no, no, it's fine. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Any anything else? I think it's best to end it here. So thanks so much for joining.